This marks the fourth of our uh, eight speakers who are coming as part of uh, the Archives in Crisis series, sponsored by the UL Department of History, uh, as well as our Gilbo Center for Public History. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to receive funding from the Gilbo Charitable Trust, as well as the Louisiana Board of Regents to help support speakers uh, like we have today. Uh, and coming up, uh, if you have interest in some of our future talks, we'll have uh, Melissa Easton next week uh, at this time in the same place, talking about community engagement and archives. Uh, Preston Huff talking about disaster response later in April. Uh, and Aaron Cowan uh, talking about grant writing as we have to fund all of these recommendations somehow. Along with Stephen Sloan who will finish up our series in May talking about oral history and archives. Uh, before I turn it over to introduce our speaker, I just want to thank uh, everyone who's helped organize this, especially uh, my co-directors at the Gilbo Center, Liz Skilton and Marissa Petru, as well as our graduate assistants who've done much of the actual work, uh, Summer Abu Kamra and Julia Fontenot back there. Um, before I turn it over to Dr. Petru for a couple uh, moments, I'd also just note if you need Wi-Fi, uh, it's the Light Public Wireless, and the password is lights at light, L-I-G-T-S at L-I-T-E. Uh, and if you want to see our previous uh, Archives in Crisis talks, if you haven't been able to attend, uh, they've been posted on YouTube, uh, and you can find them by following us on Twitter, Facebook, I think we have something else. Um, all at UL Public History. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Petra. Uh, thank you, Dr. Beamish. Thank you all for coming here today um, and joining us um, as we continue our series um, on the Archives in Crisis. So one of the other projects for the Gilbo Center for Public History, I'm about a foot shorter than Dr. Beamish, uh, um, is we are developing guidelines for land acknowledgement. Uh, um, we are developing these guidelines for the university, for our center, as well as other cultural and educational institutions, um, including museums, libraries, and archives. Um, so what is a land acknowledgement? Um, a land acknowledgement acknowledges the ongoing culture, lifeways, history of the native peoples of the land, of the region of Louisiana, for example, for, um, for our purposes. It also acknowledges the, ongo the long history of settler colonialism and that we are uninvited guests on stolen land. Um, so that we have been in the process of working on language and we've been reaching out um, to different um, native peoples for guidance. Um, and this will be an ongoing project and we welcome your advice. The language that we are working with right now is that we would like to acknowledge the ancestors of the different native peoples of the 24 different tribes of the Louisiana region and express our gratitude for stewarding this land. We'd like to express our gratitude to the elders, past, present, and future. Um, thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Summer Abu Kamra. Our speaker for today is Jason Church and he will be talking about cemetery preservation in Louisiana's history. Jason is coming all the way from the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. He is a materials conservator with the NCPTT. He divides his time between conducting in-house research, organizing various training events, and teaching hands-on conservation workshops. Uh, since 2005, he has conducted more than 100 lectures and hands-on training for cemetery conservation, and he earned his MFA in Historic Preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Summer, for, for inviting me here and, and emailing me and keeping me informed and getting me here. Um, I appreciate it. And hopefully you guys, everyone went to the talk uh, last week with Karen Pavelka. If not, you missed out. Great speaker. So I was asked to come here and talk about disaster response. My specialty is historic cemeteries. So I'm going to talk about disaster response for cemeteries. They don't have to be historic. New ones will work too. Um, Summer mentioned I am from NCPTT. So 
want to just really quickly, since we are in your backyard, and most likely you've not heard of us, um, I wanted to give you a very quick introduction. So we're located in Natchitoches, Louisiana, on the campus of Northwestern State University. And we are a research and training office of the National Park Service. So we're not your average National Park Service. We don't uh, have a park. We don't deal with fuzzy bears and bald eagles. We kind of do, but in a very different way. So what we do is look at cultural materials of all kinds. So we still get to work on bald eagles and bears, uh, just not the, the really cuddly ones. So we're broke up into four divisions. Uh, architecture, where we, of course, look at exactly that. And a lot of the things that we do is look at non-destructive testing, ways to do documentation. We are a technology center. So that's the sort of thing we focus on. Historic landscapes, such as cemeteries. Talk more about those. Archaeology and collections where we do a lot of things like 3D laser scanning, uh, ground penetrating radar, resistivity, ways of ground truthing uh, with new technologies. And the coolest department, the one I work in, is materials research. So we have six research labs, both in our own building and on the campus of Northwestern, where we do scientific research, where we look at both non-destructive and destructive ways to test historic materials, to develop new treatments for historic materials. Um, we expose to see treatments that are already on the market. How are they going to relate in the future? So, hey, the product everyone's saying great. How is that going to work on historic brick in 10 years? That's the kind of research that we do all the time. And we have paid internships for students that are really interested in this. Um, we do summer interns, six month, year long. Uh, you don't have to be a student anymore. You can be a recent graduate. That is perfectly okay. Um, the reason I like materials research the best is we look at everything. Uh, we look, get to look at all kinds of bears. We get to look at uh, ethnographic materials. We get to look at fine art. We get to look at buildings and especially, in my case, cemeteries. So that's my specialty. I get to travel all around. I'll be in Buford, South Carolina next week working with the VA on how to remove iron staining from marble. I was in Boston last week. I don't know if anybody watched the news. They're having uh, a lot of vandalism. So I was in Boston last week helping them come up with ways to remove the oil that's been poured on uh, granite monuments. How do we get that off without doing any damage to the granite itself? So we get to travel around and work with a very large range of materials. Um, Summer introduced me, so but this is me. Um, undergrad Appalachian State University, which ULL now plays in football. Uh, you guys, we hosted you last year. It was, I think it was in the 80s here during the season. I think it was 12 degrees back in Boone and snowing. So, haha. <laughs> um, so, but we're here to talk about cemeteries. So. Why are we talking about cemeteries? So this is a call response kind of thing. Show of hands, how many here have been to a cemetery, but not just for a funeral? Ah, that's a pretty good group. All right. I'm amazed how many I'll ask and people sort of give this look like, no, why? Cemeteries are a cultural landscape. Um, they're your largest sculpture garden. I was running late, we were uh, e eating right before we came here, and I was really upset on the corner of Lee, I'm not sure the other road I turned on, is a very small cemetery with a very amazing bronze statue. If you haven't seen it, it's a few blocks from here, by all means, you need to go down and see that. Um, they are the largest sculpture garden you're ever gonna find. Your town can never afford to replicate the amount of quality and craftsmanship that you already have that most of us don't even think about. So they're your public sculpture garden. They are a cultural landscape. Historically, they were a place that you visited on a fairly reg regular basis. How many people here have been to a family reunion? Less, but still a pretty good amount. 
historically, family unions were a lot of times were held at cemeteries. Why? You had more family there than you did anywhere else. So you would come there, you would sort of commune with your family, get to know them, hear stories, and do care and upkeep. We don't really do that anymore, so it takes people like us that care to then come back and really care and help the cemeteries along and preservation. So I was asked recently, actually yesterday, uh, a blogger emailed me and said, why is it that you're interested in cemeteries? And my answer was this, and it's, it's always my answer, that's our last tangible link to the past. They're not, it's not abstract, it's real. That's that person who did that thing. It's not someone I read about, I heard maybe, no, that's it, that's the person. So I use this example because I love this example and it's here in Louisiana. Um, has anybody been to Chalmette National Cemetery or to Chalmette? Ah, a few of you. So the Battle of New Orleans, Chalmette, Louisiana, there is the Chalmette National Cemetery. We ran a volunteer month there. We've done it for three years now. The first year we did it, we had high school and college students come from literally all over the U.S. Um, you're probably aware of this. There's now service spring breaks. That is not what we did on spring break. Um, wasn't aware of this till all these bus loads of kids started coming from all over the U.S. Really cool idea. Um, we probably would have been better people had we done such things. So we have all these kids coming, and they're they're out there cleaning. We cleaned uh, 12 thousand grave markers and reset 500 all volunteer all high school and college students mostly high school they were actually a lot of times the better workers especially the the girl schools so I realized that they're just doing this they don't really know who these people are or what they did so I picked some people and started talking about them and it's amazing that connection these aren't just stones these aren't names these are people so my favorite at Chalmette is Lyons Wakeman. Does anybody already know the story of Lyons Wakeman? Okay. So Lyons Wakeman joined the New York Infantry, fought, we have a great photograph of Lyons here, fought through the war. Lyons was a really good writer. They were, Lyons wrote constant letters and mailed them back. So we have a whole collection of what battles they were in, what they did, what they saw, very personal letters. Well, it ends up Lyons Wakeman's real name is Sarah Rosette. This is a woman. Her brothers all got to join the military and she didn't. So she bound herself up, cut her hair off, went down and joined, said she was much younger than she was, looked like a young boy, who cares, they can carry a rifle, off you go. It was only discovered that she was a woman after she died. And in her letters are great stories of, whoops, almost got caught when I was bathing today, going to have to be more careful tomorrow. Lots of letters like that, and she's writing back to her mom. So there's a couple of published books on her. But when they buried her, they left her as Lyons Wakeman. They said, well, that's how she died, that's how she lived. She's Lyons Wakeman. And she's out in Chalmette, along with 20,000 other soldiers lined up. This is a real person. This is a tangible thing. This is her. So that's why I like cemeteries. That's why as a conservator, I have focused on cemeteries. These are real people. So we're gonna talk about disasters. Now, even as a cemetery conservator, I love cemeteries, I think they're super important. They're definitely not the first thing we need to worry about after the storm hits. Uh, they are something we usually go much later and worry about. Every, everyone's safe, power's back on, homes are safe. Cemeteries become a later priority. So we're talking about both cemeteries like this, where we really don't have, we have flood problems, we don't have trees, and cemeteries like this, where we have real issues with high winds, uh, tree fall, that sort of thing. It definitely matters what we're starting with. All right. So when doing disaster preparedness, the biggest thing is be proactive, 
expect the worst. All the things I'm going to talk about, we need to do now, not after we've had a disaster. After we've had a disaster, it's too late. So these are the kind of things that we actually do before we have an issue. Now, we're a reactive society. We don't, we're not a very proactive people. We worry about things after it's happened. Now what do we do to fix it? And this is the opposite when we think about disasters. We have to be proactive, get ready, so that we can react much easier. So we're going to talk about documentation, uh, emergency plans, training, and then having a relationship with response companies already. Uh, before we started, I was just having a chat with Ms. Bobby Henson here, and she was just telling me that they've got some trees that need to come down. They already know the arborist. They've known them for years. They're already coming in and checking. That's rare. Usually once the tree falls, now let's go find an arborist. So she's already way ahead of the game because they've already got an open relationship before they really even need them. So the first thing we're going to talk about is documentation. So why is documentation important? Now we're going to talk about storms, but we're also going to talk about man-made disasters because like the incident I was working in last week in Boston, that's as common as a natural disaster now. So account of current condition. You don't know what you have until you really do documentation. So you want to know what your situation is right now. How many trees do you have that are already dying? How many trees do you have that are already dead? Um, what issues do you already have? Do you already have areas that flood just in a good rain? So sort of knowing what you're starting with is very important. You know, what are your current existing issues? You know, oh, well, we already have this dead tree right in the middle. Well, that's going to be a problem when a storm hits. So we need to know about that now. It also helps us to establish preservation and stabilization priorities. So this is a really good example, and this is a true story. So we have two mausoleums, similar size. Um, similar age in the same cemetery. We have this one that has deteriorated long ago. So all of the brownstone crenellation has already fallen off. What we're left with is a pretty stable structure. You know, everything that was coming off is already down. But we have an important military figure buried there. Okay, so think about that. Then we also have a mausoleum, similar age, that is currently coming apart. These are four by eight by four inch thick slabs of slate. So this one is sliding off, exposing the roof structure underneath and of course allowing water to come in. Because of that, this front facade is leaning and being held up by the four, these four by fours. That is literally holding the whole facade of the structure on. The family who's buried here had money enough to have a mausoleum, but never, they're not in the history books anywhere. What's our priority here? Which is more important? Anybody want to throw out what, what would you work on first? You need to stop this. We're going to see grandma soon if we don't fix this. This was not going anywhere. People with the money think the exact opposite, but this has someone important in it. We need to educate to explain, no, I mean, we can't have a major safety issue and the very soon potential of it remains versus one that's not going anywhere else and we can get to it later. So another thing I didn't mention, uh, thinking back to man-made issues, when doing documentation, you don't know what you have until it's been documented, and you can't prove it's yours unless you have documentation. If you have theft issues, and I've worked, unfortunately, with several cemeteries who have had this issue, 
where I worked at one cemetery. Um, there's a coffee table book, uh, Cemeteries of the South. It's a big black and white, put out in probably the 80s. Goes all through uh, Wilmington, Charleston, Savannah, St. Augustine, all the way down to Key West, New Orleans. Beautiful. Uh, would have been about two, two, 2002, probably. 2000 to 2002, a couple was stopped driving a rider truck. They were stopped along the highway, uh, 95, and discovered the entire back of the rider truck was filled with cemetery monument, monuments. On the front seat was that guidebook. They had used it as a shopping catalog and had proceeded to hit all the cemeteries in that book to alleviate those cemeteries of things that have value, including lots and lots of cast iron gates and statuary, angels, uh, small babies, uh, angels, the whole lot. They were from New Jersey. They were going up to sell at Design Mart in New York City. To lessen their plea, they had to tell where everything came from. They sort of remembered. So the cemetery I worked at, at the time got a whole sack of gates given back to us. They had never done any documentation and had no idea where those gates went. To this day, those gates are piled up in a store, storage room because they have no idea where they went. No one had ever thought, hey, we should go out and document all of our fencing, all of our gates. They may get stolen. Worked with a cemetery in Texas who had a large collection of very ornamental, uh, actually Egyptian revival bronze urns that were stolen. They went to the police and said, we've had these urns stolen. They said, great. What do they look like? Well, they're about this big. They're about this big around. Do you have pictures? But no, I, but I know them. I see them all the time. The police aren't going to hand you back a big bronze urn if you can't prove it's yours. You need documentation. And if you're coming in to take care of a cemetery and to start fixing it up for the first time, we know that is the, most the time that you have the most vandalism. Is a thief, actually this just happened to a cemetery I used to work at. If a thief's coming in to steal something, is he going to steal the fencing that's already been fixed up or the rusty stuff that's lying on the ground over here? He's going to steal the fencing that's already been fixed up. I used to be the cemetery conservator in Savannah, Georgia. Almost every fence I ever conserved is gone now. And they know who did it. They caught them. Landscape contractor. They were piling them on the back of the trucks when they left each time they mowed. Didn't feel like they were getting paid enough. We're gonna, we're, we'll, we'll fix them. We'll get a little extra pay this way. So documentation. Lots of forms are out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. They're already out there. Go look for them. I'll give you some websites. Sort of pick the one that has what you want. There's very complex ones that are multiple pages. There's very simplistic ones that are bubble sheets. Pick one form, stick with it. Say, this is how we're going to do documentation. Decide what everything means. I know what an obelisk is. You probably know what an obelisk is. Do all your volunteers know what an obelisk is? Probably not. So making a very simple PowerPoint Showing, hi, this is what an obelisk is. This is what a footstone is. Really important. Uh, I'll talk more about volunteers in a minute. I worked at a site where they hired AmeriCorps. Nothing wrong with AmeriCorps. It's a great organization. Wasn't their fault. It all went back to no training. Hired a group of AmeriCorps students. Come in. They want to document the whole cemetery, 90 acres. This is a large site. Working the entire summer. Huge crew. They never really thought, why should we train all of these workers? They, they, everyone knows what an obelisk is, right? Right. Why do we need to tell them this? Most of these students who had never been in a cemetery other than if a family member died, we were given as the conservation, coming in to do conservation, we were given the documentation. We realized real quickly, we started going to lots that had 20 headstones. When you look around, you go, well, there's 10, and they all have footstones. Unknown person, initial HM, they're footstones. No one ever told them what the difference is in a headstone and a footstone. 
So they're marking every stone, every piece is a new grave. No one told them. They would have done it right had we just done a very simple, buy some donuts, sit everybody around and say, hey, this is what we call this. Walk around, point them out and talk about it. That's all it takes. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, these are our forms. Uh, they're free, downloadable. Um, Rapid just has bubble check boxes, has a little instruction sheet that goes with it. Um, that's one example. Oh, wait, people are still writing. Um, yeah, just a real simple training. If you aren't, if you don't think you know, call me up. I have PowerPoints already made on how some of these, I'll send it to you, you can use it, no problem. Here's a couple of others. Uh, State of Texas has some really uh, user-friendly forms on theirs uh, that aren't Texas specific, they're just, they're from the state. Uh, Chikora Foundation, a uh, lot of great information on their website, period. Uh, if you're interested in cemetery preservation, uh, they're an archaeology firm who also specializes in historic cemetery preservation. A lot of good info on their website. Um, if you're really into archaeology, any archaeologist here? One, okay. Well, so if you want to be interested in archaeology, um, their reports are some of the best I've ever read. You can download their reports uh, where they've done uh, digs in cemeteries to do documentation. Really good stuff. All right. So we talked about before, coming up with training, figuring out what everything means, training everyone. Um, now, you know, we started, when we started doing these, we were doing paper forms. There's no reason to do paper forms anymore. Everybody's got an iPhone, everybody's got a tablet. Um, I've been playing around a lot with Google Forms lately. I mean, there's, there's so many things. Um, I'm redoing a cemetery right now with a group of cadet and senior Girl Scouts. I have a Girl Scout troop. I have four daughters. So we are bringing back and reclaiming a cemetery that uh, was originally a slave cemetery for the Reedheimer Plantation. When we were asked to come out, we were shown about six graves and said, this is it. Uh, we're now up to a space about the size of this room with probably 40, 50 graves and probably twice that many unmarked that we're finding. Um, we started, we were going to go with paper and I realized every single kid here has a phone, has an iPhone on them. We're just going to go with Google Forms and let everybody do their picture and the form on their iPhone. Every volunteer you have probably is going to come out with an iPhone. Involve the community. Something like 70% of all Eagle Scout projects involve a church or a cemetery. If you know, if you've come out, you know, hey, this is what we need, go to your local council. Ask them, say, hey, do you have anybody want to do an Eagle Scout project? Do you have girls that want to do uh, their gold award? Do you have troops that are looking for community service? Easy way. Um, you're here on campus. A lot of universities, I don't know about ULL, I know NSU where we are, the fraternities and sororities have to do so much service learning now to keep their charter. More than happy, they think it's cool, they'll come out. If you have a lot of uh, veterans graves, National Guard will come out, VFW will come out. Um, yeah, we've, it, people are interested in cemeteries. It's amazing how much volunteer work you can get by just going around asking a few people. Um, We've all, we documented all of American Cemetery in Natchitoches with volunteers. Um, we're redoing that entire cemetery in, in Reedheimer, all Girl Scouts. All right, so back to disasters. First thing, maybe you have a historic cemetery and you don't have records. Maybe you have a municipal cemetery or a modern cemetery and you do have records. What are you going to do about them? What are you going to do? These are super important legal documents that need to be protected. So it's not just about the really pretty angels. It's about, remember, what our cemetery is for. What are we going to do with these records? So we work in a lot of places and they say, oh, well, you know, we've got them all organized and we've got them bound and it wouldn't take much for these to be gone. So what do we do about that? 
And I talked to a lot of people in there, but we've got these really nice cabinets. Uh, here's Karen Pavelka, uh, last, your last speaker. You know, they've got these great cabinets, they're right, but that cabinet's not going to hold up, it's not going to survive it. So what do we do about that? Because when the storm comes in and the waters swirl around and recede, this is what you're going to get left with. This is a registry, by the way. The, I can't tell you where these are legal documents. These are burial records for a very large place. This is what happens when the flood water recedes. This is what you get left with. So what do we do about that? First thing we need to do, digitize. There are grants out there for that. This is something else you can do with volunteer work, but we have to figure out how to get the records into a digital format. Once you do, you have to back it up, and the backup cannot be on the other side of the office. The backup needs to be somewhere else. Stick them online, pay for a service if you need to, have that backup in California. This is a cemetery we worked at in Mississippi after Katrina. There's the office. That's it. We were told, we said, did you have, and this was a modern cemetery that was still active. It's hard to believe that, but it, it is. And we said, well, where's your records? And this is the front porch, by the way. This is the whole building. And they said, oh, well, we had them all digitized, so it were okay. I was like, oh, great. Well, you know, obviously your digital copies from here are gone. Did you have them backed up? We sure did. We're at the caretaker, the caretaker in charge of the cemetery. He had them all backed up on hard drives at his house. Great. Where's his house? We don't know. It was gone. All records, gone. No paper, no digital, gone. Period. Nothing left. So backing them up three blocks away, not a good solution. Stick them in the cloud somewhere. Um, it's too easy now. We can't complain that we don't know how to do it. Um, it's too easy to back up digital records now. So go, going back to my, my cabinets, sort of an extreme example, but a realistic one. When I worked for the city of Savannah, they were currently, and I've been gone there 14 years now, when I was there, they were working toward digitizing. They had a full-time uh, worker that was just digitizing every day, but the reality is you had five municipal cemeteries going back to the 1700s. That's a lot of records, so it's going to take time. They had all of their records in fireproof cabinets. So what happens? Savannah's right on the coast. Hurricanes come. We had a trailer that stays in the lot that has MREs and a cot in it, and there are people assigned with a radio. When the storm's coming, they get a call. Their job is to go and take every one of these cabinets, put them in the trailer, and go to Thomasville, Georgia. And there is a place in the city lot in Thomasville, Georgia, where they park that trailer, they sleep with that trailer, and they do not leave until they get the all coast is clear and they bring all the records back. And they know that's their job. And every couple of years, if they haven't had a storm, they practice it. And they have to roll every one of the records, these huge fireproof fire, fire cabinets, load in the trailer. They have gas cans ready in case the vehicle runs out. They've got spare tires. They have everything they need to get to Thomasville and to live with that trailer and never leave it until it can come back. Extreme example, but it's one that works for them, and it's a realistic solution to protect those records. If you have a modern office, you might want to consider D-Plan. I don't know if Karen or any of the other speakers have talked about that. It's an online where you go in, you enter all the information about your facility. Where's the electrical cutoff? Where is the records cap? All that sort of thing, and you build your own plan in this software. And then having training for that. Does everyone know? So, for example, when I was with the city of Savannah, we all, once a year before hurricane season, we had drills. The people who knew, they know where the dolly is, they know where the cabinets are, they've checked the fuel, they're ready. Remember, we want to be proactive. 
So pre-storm checklists and then running drills. Do you have the tools you will need once a storm or disaster hits your site? Because once it hits, we all know this, if you've ever lived through, if you lived through Katrina and Rita, or any of the ones, you're not going to buy them afterwards. You couldn't buy a gas can in the state of Louisiana for a year after Katrina. You're not going to go, oh, well, I really need a couple more fuel cans. Let me go get one. Not going to happen. You had to have already had that. I bet a chainsaw after Rita and the gas can around it was probably worth its weight in gold. You weren't going to find it. So thinking about the cemetery infrastructure, if you have a larger cemetery that has drains, is that going to work? It's not going to do anything. This is, a cem this is a drain in a cemetery. So this is something that, okay, we're running our drill. We're thinking about hurricane season. We're thinking about the rainy season. We need to go, oh, that's not going to work. Let me fix that. Let me get ready for it. Because that would be the difference in a few inches of water or a few feet. Running drills. So I'm on an emergency response team. Uh, Karen, who spoke last time, she's on the same emergency response team. We get deployed. Uh, as conservators to go look at museums and archives and things like that after a disaster. So when we do training, we actually go to places, and one of them is uh, we did training in Houston at um, Bayou Bend. Has anybody been there? It's a big house museum owned by MFA Houston. You've been there. Great. If you get a chance to go to Houston, it's a huge house museum with this very, very awesome sculpture and botanical garden around it. They have a full disaster plan for every tree. Every sculpture, every large planting in that park has its own disaster plan. They have a company on retainer so that when a disaster hits, if they can't get in, they don't care. They already have that company who does the, the arborist company already has the preservation plan and they know this is what we have to do. No one has to call them. They've already been informed. They already know what it's going to cost, what to do. And then once a year, they run before hurricane season. They run drills so that everyone on their staff knows what we're supposed to be doing. So why wait? Talked about that earlier. Go ahead and contact them now. Um, I gave the example of Ms. Henson earlier. She's already got her arborist lined up. They already have a relationship. Have that relationship. Go ahead and talk to a disaster cleanup company and say, hey, something happens. You know, what are you doing on Tuesday? Hey, it's a pretty sunny day. Would you come by and just look at and talk with me about the kind of issues that we have and what we might need? Um, FEMA has pre-disaster mitigation. They have online forms. They have online training you can take. Um, if you have a more modern cemetery, talking to someone like DMORT, DMORT is FEMA's mortuary response group. So F FEMA actually has its own morgue. These are all volunteers. There are morticians from around the country who, uh, who show up. Unfortunately, we had to work with them before talk to them about what are we going to do if it floods and now we have unfortunately I've had to work with a few if you get flooding especially in a more modern cemetery not necessarily a historic one if you get a lot of flooding in a historic cemetery and the water sits long enough how many here has held a basketball under the water at a pool what happens when you let go of the basketball same thing happens to a sealed coffin. You get enough water, sits for long enough, pew! Uh, there's a video of, uh, I think it was Athens, Georgia. They had major flooding about 10 years ago. One of the maintenance guys shot a video of coffins going 10, 15 feet straight up in the air. 
The problem is once that goes up, it's not coming back where it went. It's coming back somewhere else. And that hole fills back up with water and dirt. So when they were done, they had all these coffins, but no holes left in the ground. Where do they go? They had no idea. There's actually, that cemetery has now a, a large memorial to all the ones that they could never relocate. And the state of Georgia started a, a law that next year that all bodies have to be tagged. So there's a wire tag with the information inside the coffin and the coffin itself is labeled as well. So that they never had to worry about that again. We don't have that law here as far as I know. I'm pretty sure we don't. All right, so disaster strikes. You guys recognize this picture? <laughs> so what do we do? We talk mostly about hurricanes as Louisiana, so what we think about floods, winds, ice, fire. Uh, of course, man-made, we talked a little bit more about that. Um, and that could be just, just straight out vandalism. We don't really have this issue, um, but it's a pretty serious one. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures in a minute of, of sort of what happens with, with ice storms. Um, and I do a lot of work up north, and that's a huge concern. Of course, a lot more than hurricanes and things like that for them. So it happens. Calm down, figure out, all right, what do I do about this? What, was, what have we talked about? What's our disaster plan for this? And then you start from there. So the first thing you have to do is figure out, can you even get back in the cemetery? Do you have power lines down? Do you have sinkholes? Do you have natural gas? A lot of cemeteries now are putting in the really nice gas burning uh, street lights. Beautiful ambient light gives a great historic feel. You've got gas lines running all through your cemetery now. Do you know how to turn those off? Do you know how to check to see if they're off? Do you have someone on standby who could come and check before you start bringing in volunteers or workers and don't realize you have power lines and gas lines live and active all over your cemetery. Um, do you know how to turn off the water lines? That's a big one. Um, I've worked at lots of cemeteries where something happened just in maintenance. Someone pulls a hose, it snaps the hose bib off, and everyone stares at each other because no one knows how to turn the lines off to the cemetery. And you've got a fountain going up 20 feet and everyone's going, we could just leave. Uh, I was at a site one time, and that was the answer. If we leave, someone else will see it. Not a good solution. Holes. We talked about earlier. That's exactly what we've got here. These are where coffins have left. Now you've got a huge hole all around. Unstable markers. You know, probably not the safest picture. Um, so they're down there to figure out if the coffin's still intact or not, trying to identify. These are uh, demort responders trying to identify where coffins might go. This is here in Louisiana. Unstable markers. Do we want to bring in a bunch of people? No. We need to get caution tape around these. We need to get these propped up with something. You know, if we've got a tree that's being held up by a stone, not the safest thing to go around until we're ready. Um, oh, you can't read it. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is after a disaster in Corpus Christi. We were doing work. I love the stone. Um, he died as he lived, a pure and upright man. <laughs> so I always thought that was funny. Um, so, you know, it's not going to take much more for this to go off. Um, most likely there's nothing between these. Um, uh, historically, they would have had just a little bit of lime mortar between them that deteriorates, and gravity's holding them together right now. So it's not going to take a whole lot for this 800-pound stone to drop. That's just this part. It's probably about 800 pounds. So a definite safety hazard. Uh, we need to mark these. We need to caution tape them off. Uh, we need to know where they are before we start bringing in a bunch of people. Uh, and to try to do work. 
talked about documentation already. Tree removal. So this is a great example. This is an ice storm. Like I said, we don't really have them here. This is in Kentucky. This is, part, I have another picture. This is sort of the beginning of one of the most amazing groupings of sculpture you're ever gonna see. This is a full funeral procession. Dogs, cats, animals, husbands, wives, kids, horsebacks. Uh, there's like 30 sculptures in this one lot. And unfortunately, all the trees in that area came down. So what do we do about that? Do we know people, like I said, before we need them, do we know people that can come in and are qualified and skilled to take these things down? Because you can't just walk in and start cutting limbs and letting them fall. You're going to end up with more damage by taking the tree out than the tree did. I was just, we were talking before the, before the talk started, um, a cemetery local to me, we advised them several times, they weren't interested, eventually the tree came down. The company they got to come in, low bid, came in, did more damage cutting up the tree that was down than the tree did when it fell. When you bring in a, train, a crane truck, it has outriggers. Those outriggers have to go somewhere. If you got a cemetery full of ledgers and full of markers, if you have someone who doesn't know what they're doing, in this case, they brought the outriggers right down and went right through large marble ledgers. Could have driven forward about a foot, missed that. Wasn't really a big concern for them. That's not what they were there for. So you have to have someone who thinks about these things. How important this is a sculpture garden. This isn't just the old city cemetery that had a tree come down, we're gonna go cut it up like we would out of your front yard. It's very different. This is a great example. It's hard to see in the photograph because there's so much going on. He's getting ready to cut. All of this roping is hooked to all these sections. When they cut it, it stays put until he glides it down to a trash pile that he's got ready. He's going to miss all the markers. Building plywood boxes around markers before things drop. These are the kind of things you have to talk to an arborist about. Can you cable these branches so they don't fall straight down? Because this is what's below you. More markers. Markers that have been tipped. Markers that are being tipped, but they're still in completely intact. We can put that back no problem. This is an easy repair for us. They cut this limb and it falls, it's going to snap that in half. Now we've, we've got a lot more repairs and a lot more damage. So things to think about, things to talk to an arborist about before the disaster comes. This is part of that lot that I showed you of all the, the family members. You know, we have one dog, we have a leg, an arm, a couple of legs. Tag it, label it, keep it. I don't, I can't tell you how many times I've worked on sites where they, the Either the landscape company or the arborist came in and they cut everything up and they did a great job and they start hauling stuff off and they just throw these with it. Well, it's broken. Were you going to use that? I mean, it's a broken piece. I'm trying to clean this area up. I've worked at sites and you come back and go, this ledger, where's all the pieces? I, we probably got rid of them when we cleaned up the tree. We can put all those back. As conservators, these are all important pieces. You wouldn't walk in a museum, someone hits a sculpture, it breaks, and, and then go, eh, those are the pieces that broke off, just toss them. Would never happen. For some reason, all this stuff is just, eh, well, you know, we're not going to use that anyway. The other thing is, if you have a good system, if you have a, either a strong owner or a good, really established volunteer or uh, foundation, then you can take, get people to take pieces. If you don't, then just leave them. Um, I've worked at several sites. They go, well, we collected all the pieces. Well, we're here to do work. Where are they? I don't know. And all of a sudden, somebody's got them. 
but you don't know who. So if you have, okay, this is a city cemetery. Okay, they're going to city lot. They're going to the caretaker. It's corporately owned or going into the office or some really long established, like the Rapids uh, Historic Cemetery Group. We know, hey, this is the president. It's been the president forever. We can take those pieces. It's better to go ahead and get them out because people are going to walk by and go, oh, that's really cool. They walk away. I don't know how many. Somewhere, somewhere is a collection of thousands of hands. I, I see them all the time. I have no idea where they go. Fingers, they walk away and are gone forever. All right, so we sort of talked about more man-made disasters. What about uh, natural disasters? What about man-made disasters? So maybe we have this. Maybe we have some jerk named the Big Show who comes in Marxist territory. Fine. Call a conservator. Call me. Send me a picture. Call someone in your area that does preservation work and talk to him about how do we get this off. You won't find a whole lot of information out there about online like for example at NCPT we have lots of videos on cleaning and resetting and repair work you're never gonna find a graffiti removal there's too many variables what's the color of the paint what's the temperature when it's put on what kind of paint how was it put on what kind of stone is it how wet was the stone all these things are questions I'm gonna ask you when you send me a picture and all that's gonna depend on what might take it off The reality is that most of the time, what we see is either hate or politically motivated. Now, yes, yeah, the priest of Cohen, it's a, Jew, a Jewish religious order, um, or Vulcan, either one. Um, so when you have this, this is only my own personal opinion from now years of experience, call the police, get a report, do not call the news station. Do not call the press. Do not post pictures on Instagram. Call the police and wrap it up. Take a tarp, wrap it up, call me. Call a conservator and say, we've got some spray paint, we've got some graffiti, we need it removed. And that's the only people you tell. Because we know for a fact, vandalism gets copied. You get copycat vandalism. How many people here remember the Jewish cemetery? They got hit pretty hard a couple of years ago uh, up around Baltimore and Phil uh, Philadelphia. That was not the only one. There were three hit directly afterwards. And we know for a fact, they watched it on TV and said, yeah, now, Thousands of people know how I felt and know what I wanted to tell everyone. I bet I can do this too and get my message across and thousands more will know my message. And that's what happens. You get copycat vandalism. And they got what they wanted. Were they mad at this one person? They don't know that person. Person means nothing to them. They want a message of hate to be passed on and they got it. So wrap it up, call a conservator, get it off, but I would recommend not calling the news or posting it. Let the news post it, I mean, let the police post it. Say later, you had vandalism, you're looking for people, but showing the pictures, that's just repeating the, the message. So setting priorities. So we had our disaster come through, where do we start? How do we start here? This is the kind of thing we need sort of in writing. One of the biggest things in the disaster response group I'm a member of, uh, we take a training every year on something new. It could be how to get mold off fabric one year. It could be how to safely enter a building the next. We always get training. The most important training I think I've ever taken was with a group of psychologists that came in and talked to us about the mentality after a disaster. And I know, I know Andy's done deployments. Anyone that has, they can attest to this. 
you have this mentality of it, we can't save anything. Th throw everything out. There's nothing we can do about it. It's, it's done. Just bulldoze the whole place. Because, you know, you're at your lowest. This is a place you love. If you care for a cemetery, I don't care if you're just the guy who mows the grass, you fall in love with it. This is your cemetery. You love this place. You know the names. I did a study for the VA where I went around for five years and worked on 24 headstones on six cemeteries. To this day, I can probably name more than half of the soldiers that I worked on. You become connected with them. So when all of a sudden you come in and it looks like this, you have, it, everything is gone. You completely are defeated. And a lot of times bad decisions get made because it's like, oh, we can't do anything about this. We, there's just nothing we do, just I'm done with it. Having a plan beforehand says, okay, the trees that are hanging, they have to come down first. I know this. I have a checklist. I can go through it and say, this is what I've got to do. That's why all this is so important to do before you have to walk in and deal with this. It's the same thing. How many here have ever discussed with your family, if we have to evacuate, what things are we taking? How many times has mom said, the wedding album's got to come, your baby books have to come, I don't care about the rest. You have to have a plan, even if it's that sort of thing. What are, what are we grabbing if the, if the flood waters are coming? And just coming up with the priorities. You know, remains are the most important. Safety's the next most important. Well, safety's the most important. Electrical lines off, gas lines off. The second is we've got to get remains covered up. We've got to get things tinted. We've got to get um, covered up. Uh, any, anything like that, we need to put plywood up, we need to put plastic up, we need to get any remains covered. Photographs right afterwards. Um, I don't know how many times we heard, well, the hurricane came through or the tornadoes came through and we didn't take any pictures, we really didn't worry about it, and then another one hit right on top of it. So come in, take in some real basic pictures to start with. Um, and you can see here, they've gone ahead. Even though we can all find that those are missing graves, they have a very pronounced, maybe not, maybe it starts raining next week and we have a month of flooding before we can get back. They've gone in, they've driven in about three or four foot stakes. They've written on them. They've tried to mark them in some way in case they're not there. And then, of course, you know, you've got to call in for help. What do we do about this? I'm not going to deal with that. I'm a conservator. I work on the stones. I don't work on the residents. So I have to know, oh, this is, this is the end for me. We've got to make calls. Um, this is beyond my level of, of expertise. So as I'm wrapping up, and I hope you have questions, because I left some time for it. Um, if anyone's interested, um, I'm going to give you my information. Please email me. Um, one of the things that we do a lot of are hands-on workshops. Are you interested in learning how to clean this sort of thing, how to repair and restore and conserve actual cemetery stuff? We do these workshops all over the country, but we very rarely uh, I haven't done one in the state of Louisiana in years, but um, I don't know what's Pineville, an hour from here, a little bit more. What's that? An hour and 46. There you go. So an hour and 46 minutes away. Uh, so May 9th and 10th of this year, we're going to be doing a workshop. Um, two days, three conservators, round robin, small groups. We'll go over resetting, cleaning repairs, documentation, um, you know, we'll, we'll teach you how to put these back into pieces so you can't see it. Um, so that's the kind of thing we do. And like I said, we very rarely come to Louisiana, stay in Louisiana, because uh, we're usually traveling. So um, this, is, this is a good opportunity if you get it. And also, if you're interested, uh, free to join, 
go on Facebook, Louisiana AGS. So go check out the Association for Gravestone Studies is a national organization that focuses on, you guessed it, gravestone studies. Everything from carvers to monument types to the history of um, funerary and memorial practices to um, you know, preservation. Every state has, well not every state, most states have chapters. Uh, we have a Louisiana chapter. You can go join our Facebook, follow us. Uh, we'll post workshops, events. Uh, I should have posted this one now that I think about it. Whoops. Um, yeah, lectures around the state that are cemetery related. We'll post them. That's me. Uh, I should remove the phone number. It's a horrible way to get a hold of me. <laughs> there are people in the room shaking their head yes right now. Um, yeah, I'm rarely there, and when I am, uh, my voice mail is usually full. <laughs> Amy works in our office. She's saying yes, because unfortunately, Amy's had to take messages for me, because my people get very mad. Uh, email's great, though. I can check email anywhere I am uh, and get back with you. And if you do have questions, pictures with your email is awesome, because um, I'm the first thing I'm going to ask you is, sounds great. I'd love to help you. Can you send me a picture? Uh, picture's worth a thousand words. We can really see what you're talking about and what the issues are uh, with that. Questions for me? Yes, ma'am. Really put you on the spot. Thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, thanks. In Iberia Parish, we have several um, rural, rural located uh, cemeteries, and uh, we have an association called the Iberia African American Historical Society, and we're trying to document our history from uh, Civil War era to the end of the Jim Crow period. And um, right now, we're we're looking at a huge cemetery, black cemetery in the heart of town. It's filled with the remains of veterans from the Civil War to the end of uh, the Vietnam period. And it's important to us because um, th there are very few books, no, no, there are books in our libraries that talk about the veterans of Iberia, but they're all white. Sure. But the, the evidence is all around us, not just the documentation from the VA, but the evidence of these men's beautiful markers and, and statues. Uh, sometimes along the way, we come across some of them that are broken. Until we can get funding, what's the best way to handle these broken markers? I mean, they're, they're just, it, it's heartbreaking how beautiful they are. So just to recap, the question is, they've got broken markers. Um, they're not ready yet to start putting them back together. What do you do with them? So one of the things that I see a lot that I recommend not doing is, let me see something. So a lot of times you'll have um, marble markers that are broken and people want them to still be seen so they lean them up like this. That's what we see a lot. The problem with marble is it will warp. You've got rain coming down, sun coming down, it'll cup like a potato chip. So I'm gonna flip back real fast. Um, Yep, here's a good, I figured there was, there was one. These right here, not what we want because those will eventually, and then when we do get around to fixing them, you'll have a straight bottom and a curved top and we can't straighten those. We can't do anything about it. We can flip them the other way and wait. Might be a year, might be 20 years. They'll straighten out, but they'll probably crack in the process. So, it depends. Um, documentation is really important. Photograph them really well. Lay them out uh, nice flat. If you have an area that's, you know, it's easy here. We have these big ledgers. We can lay them flat like that. They're not going anywhere. If you don't, let's say we're somewhere over in here where we have, we're worried about the mowers hitting them. If they're on the ground, the mower's going to hit them. A lot of times what we'll do is take one by twos or one by four pieces of wood make a little box, a little bit bigger, maybe six inches bigger than the, than the marker, fill it up with playground sand. 
lay the marker on it. Now the mower won't go over it or hit it. They're going to go around it. And even when they're weed eating, it's going to hit that wood around it. And you've made a nice little cushion area. They'll sit in the sand with no problem. Uh, that won't cause any damage or anything to them. And then when you're done, you can pull up that wood, get you a bucket, throw that sand back in it. The grass will grow back in a few months. You'll never know it was there when you do get the chance to do the preservation work. Um, so I recommend leaving them in the cemetery. A lot of people want to take them home. It kind of opens up a new can of worms. Um, are they going to get lost? Um, hey, that sounds weird. I've worked on too many sites that has done that, and they're gone. We don't know where they went. Um, I, I worked on a cemetery one time. Oh, I didn't talk about this. Let me back up. This is, reminds me, but I didn't mention it earlier. So we do our documentation. So we've documented our whole cemetery. Please share that with someone. Stick it on the cloud as a backup. Take it to your local library and give it to them for the genealogical collection. Almost every library has a genealogy room now. Genealogy is the fastest growing pastime in America. They would love to have it. Give it to someone. Please don't hold it to yourself. I've worked with too many groups that have been like, no, we did all the work. It's ours. I gave a talk in uh, Bastrop, Louisiana, one time, and I was saying this. I, it, was all, it was a complete talk about documentation. And I was talking about you need to back it up. You need to share it. Go to Kinko's, print a copy, give it to the library. And every, there was this weird tension in the room, and I finally said, all right, what's up? Something's going on. And they explained to me that they had documented every cemetery in the parish, and they kept it on a program called Lotus One Two Three. The older people are laughing because they know where I'm going with this. Nothing can read that. That's a dead, you can't back that up. You can't read it. You can't access it. They had years worth of work on five inch floppies that were garbage and they were starting over. And I said, no one thought to just get it printed once. Well, that would have been expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than starting over, isn't it? Share it with someone, take it to the library, share that information um so yeah good documentation uh i recommend leaving it there um kind of putting it put a little border around it fill it with some playground sand you can buy in 50 pound bags at the hardware store playground sand it's clean works well yes um, so i thought oh, sorry thank you hi um yeah, this I found all of this really interesting. I was Yay. It sounds like if you have if your cemetery has a lot of money, then you could follow this. But if you are working on a really tight budget, do you have like a checklist of particular supplies that you think every cemetery should have? It seems like tarp might be good and Okay. You don't need a lot of money for any of this. You can do amazing stuff with volunteer labor. And I talked about earlier, get the Boy Scouts involved, get the National Guard involved, uh, you know, get the VFW involved. You can do all your documentation, a lot of your work. Hey, you know, we're starting a committee of people for disaster recovery. Now, I'm going to need you if something happens. You've got a chainsaw, right? Oh, and I heard you, you've got wheelbarrows, right? We're going to need those when the time comes. So we're going to need gas, chainsaws, tarps, sort of basic things like that. And you're an electrician, right? Or isn't your brother-in-law an electrician? Could he come out and look at it and see how we would turn the main lines off into our cemetery? Because we don't know how to do that. Could we call him if something happened? Could he come out and show me how to do that? Oh, wait, your father-in-law is a plumber? We're going to have an event where we're buying donuts for everybody next weekend, and we're, we're walking around, we're talking. Would he come out and show us how to turn the water off? Or if it's hooked to the city and we don't have a turn off, show us how to bandage a line if one breaks. You can do a lot of this with volunteer work and on a, on a shoestring budget. Um, and then if you get enough people interested, enough people active, you can start fundraising. Um, you, you, can, you can get a lot done without having a large or any budget. You have to be creative and lean on people to do stuff for you. Uh, 
Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah. So if you'll email me, uh, the registration will go up this week or next. You just email me, and I'll send you the information on it. Oh, it is. Yeah. I'm sorry that it. Yeah, there you go. Yes, yeah, so the registration hadn't gone up. We haven't even announced it. This is the first time we've even said anything about it. Um, but yeah, we'll get registration up in the next few days. And if you're interested, email me and I'll send you the info. Other questions? Anything, it doesn't have to be disaster, just any cemetery related. Um, I probably can answer it. So I have, I guess, one question that yeah. I don't know uh, if you know the answer to, because it seems like it's in progress. But I saw recently there's um, a bill uh, in committee in Congress to create the African American Burial Ground Network as part of the National Park Service. Do you know, could you tell us anything about that? Or is that still? That's still an, an early bill. That's as far as I know about it as well. So. Sorry. Yes. Uh, sure. I want to say uh, Louisiana Cemetery law states that to to either handle the human remains, you have to have a degree in archaeology or uh, mortuary science. Is that correct? Yeah. So if you have exposed remains in your cemetery, you have to call um, state archaeologist or the SHPO's office, the State Historic Preservation Office, and tell them and they'll send someone. But you're not allowed to just go, hey, let's box this up. Uh, if you have exposed remains, you have to call an authority. Um, you can call the local police. They'll come down. But usually, they're just going to turn around and call someone else. Um, but yeah, you can call the state uh, SHPO office in Baton Rouge. They'll send the st a state archaeologist down. But yeah, you can't can't box them up yourself. Uh, the the Louisiana cemetery laws that I was looking at states that uh, you have to have someone with one of those degrees uh, overseeing the project. But if the the remains are being unearthed and put back in the same I guess time period, not leaving the cemetery, then that's not necessarily. Uh, that may be a technicality I don't know about. Usually, if you're handling remains, you have to have someone there to supervise. So. Yes. So mine's fairly quick. Um, so this entire series has been looking at archives in crisis and mm -hmm. broadly things that we both need and things that we would like to see in terms of support for our archives. And thinking of cemeteries as a an archive, um, what's something you would like to see the state do to assist or that you think at the community level we could do to greater assist our cemeteries in their preservation efforts? I more recognition, more documentation. Um, we talked about, I mentioned earlier how, how important genealogy is right now to sort of the public psyche. Uh, in the past, that wasn't. So with that, we're getting a lot more recognition from cemeteries. Like I said, I teach classes earlier. I was talking about earlier. I teach classes. They fill up, and it's, it's generally 90% you know, are that baby boomer generation who we're doing genealogy and we found great great uncle on the back 40 and man we're no one's going to do it we're going to do it one of the things i worry about with that is so i've been teaching classes now with the park service for 14 years i do maybe six a year i would say the average age of my attendees is mid to late 50s that's great. They're not going to be doing this a whole lot longer. Love to see younger people taking an interest and coming in and learning it. 
because, you know, great, I've trained thousands of people that probably aren't going to be working more than 10 more years. Then we're going to have to start all over again. So that would be really nice, but at, on a state level, just more documentation, um, posting more things online. I didn't even mention this. So this is one of the bad things with with talks is you start thinking about like, oh, I should have talked about that. Um, findagrave.com, if anybody's, yeah, lots of head shaking. Uh, easy phone app, great website, things like that. Just a lot of cemeteries have already been documented, loading it to things like that that people can find. Because not only is it great for a genealogist sitting in California that's researching their roots, but for me doing preservation work, a good example is um, I guess it's oh, about a year ago now, uh, outside of Leesville, Louisiana, we had a cemetery completely vandalized. Had about 20 stones, I think 18 of them were destroyed. Two kids and a couple six packs thought that would be a great idea on a lark. Picked up a stone, picked up one stone, threw it through the next, and they continued until they had completely shattered all but two more modern granite markers no documentation that we knew of. So we have hundreds of little pieces of marble about this big. What do we do with that? I, most of them, all but one, we could put back together, but we've, if you guys like jigsaw puzzles, imagine taking 10 boxes and dumping them on the floor together. And they're all the same color. So what do we do about that? Luckily, we locked up, had my phone on me, just decided let's check out Find a Grave, and someone had photographed and transcribed all, we were able to take their photograph, we don't know the person, some lady who, thank goodness, she came out and did it on her own, volunteer, we were able to take those photographs and put them all back together. You know, laying out on a tarp, going up, oh, this is this thick, this is the corner that looks like this, we were able to put them all back together. That kind of documentation, just getting the public more interested and more aware and putting more of that out there, um, we live in a technology age of information. There's no reason we can't load all this stuff up online and have it all accessible. Um, so just getting more people interested in doing stuff like that, I think would be important. Um, on a state level, you know, if I had a dream, it would be some sort of state preservation grant. They don't exist. Other states have them, we don't. Um, you know, YouTube audience that knows the government. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I know other states have, uh, I do a lot of work in Massachusetts. They use part of the tax base. A certain point portion is pulled out for only preservation. A lot of cemeteries are getting saved in that state because of that. A lot of cemetery conservators working in that state because of it. Because a certain percent, I don't know the percent, gets pulled out only for preservation. So having something like that, a small tax piece or a small, you know, this much of the lottery gets pulled out for preservation. Doesn't have to be cemeteries, but just preservation in our state, period. But making that an option in a state grant system for preservation, making cemeteries an option in it would be amazing. Right now, that doesn't exist. If you're working in a cemetery, you're going to have to raise your own funds. There are no federal or state funds available for that. Um, Well, the uh, particular cemetery that I was talking about earlier, um, there, are, there are a group of people representing the various churches that are owners of these cemeteries. Mm -hmm. And um, we were told by someone from the cemetery board and the attorney general's office that we would have to have those cemeteries declared as abandoned. And then the state would step in and help t in the restoration of those cemeteries. Do you? I've never anything? heard that. Never heard that. Because we've been encouraged to have them abandoned. Be yeah. very careful with that term. Abandoned? Yes. Because if a site is abandoned, that means there is no one. Who's the owner? Who's the owner? That opens books for developers to take over a site because it is abandoned. Now, I don't know the Louisiana law. I've never seen an abandoned law in the state of Louisiana. I've worked a lot in Kentucky and West Virginia. In the state of Kentucky, if it's abandoned, it is no longer a historic site, and it can be demolished. 
if it is legally abandoned. And they, they only take that rule by saying no one has interacted with it. And it's short, it's like 20 years. Mm -hmm. A simple, hey, we posted on Find a Grave, it's no longer abandoned, it is being interacted with. And that's all it takes. And that's a law that lets mining companies, which is an issue here, you know, you can frack and mine in areas um, that might have cemeteries. So I, know, I don't know, I can't say about Louisiana, but I do know other states have laws that if it is abandoned, it is no longer historic and can be legally moved or disposed of because it is abandoned. Thank so you. I would be very careful allowing it to be an abandoned site. Yeah, because we have another one that is, we have it registered with the state now. And another friend and I documented trying to find out when this cemetery started. And we know it started in the, at least 1870. And it hadn't been used in a long time. But the land records for it always stated the land was sold minus this superficial arpent where the cemetery was and a 20-foot right away on the northern border because somebody else just bought this property in 2015 and he started clearing the trees in the area around it until somebody noticed that cemetery and we're still trying to make sure that people that know that they have relatives back there can get back there mm -hmm. yeah trying to keep it established right of way mm -hmm. Uh, does anybody want one last question? Uh, yeah. Thanks. I have a question in regard to um, old cemeteries. I have one from where I'm at that is just out of the way enough to not be noticed. Unfortunately, though, all the uh, markers, identification markers on it, on them have been um, removed, scattered around the woods where it's located at. Every so often we get lucky and we'll find bits and pieces of them. We're doing some different types of age processing to find out what belongs to which one and everything else. When we do find the pieces though, um, like I said, it's not one of those normal routes one would travel, but enough for someone to come back and vandalize the pieces as we find them. Is it almost better just to tag where they're at and leave them unnoticed cover them up with leaves again and hopefully not one find them or try and find another way of preserving them so no one else will steal them. So do you think the pieces are being stolen or is this a past vandalism that probably isn't prevalent anymore? Uh, both. Uh, years ago, um, the last one was buried there in 1886. Um, overgrown with woods, a lot of the family members passed away or moved away. And within the last 10 or so years, work's been started again on it, give or take. And the first uh, crew that went in chopped, basically chopped the trees down all around it and drug them over the graves, dragging the bricks with them, all, scattering them all over the place. And unfortunately, um, it wasn't realized until after it had already been done. And so people come out there now that it's a little bit more known and bricks are starting to vanish that got drug off the graves. And uh, a friend of mine found one of the parts of a headstone that we had overlooked. It was further out in the woods. So we're having to kind of expand our search area for it. And that's why I was curious, uh, do you just eventually just tag them and cover them up and hope for a better day? So generally what we find uh, and it's not always the case, especially it sounds like with yours. Generally what we find, um, I did some work in Virginia City, Nevada with the uh, Comstock Cemetery. And they did a, when the current director took over, the first thing she did was find all the people who had been arrested for cemetery vandalism and start writing them letters. Why did you do it? Trying to figure out a mentality. The number one answer, I mean like 90 some percent people said they didn't think anyone would care. They didn't know anyone was coming out. They didn't think anyone would mind. So one of the things that we find is when we first start really working, you know, run some things in the paper, put some signage up, maybe get some lights, you know, really start working a cemetery, 
you'll see a curve in the vandalism because all of a sudden people go, oh, right, this is somewhere important. People care. Yeah, well, let's not go there. Uh, there's people there all the time now. We, we don't want to, you know, we can go over this way instead. So people stop generally going. Sounds like that's really not the case for you. So, yeah, what I would recommend is really good documentation of what you find. And then I would probably, when we do bury artifacts back, and, and we do, uh, if we have an area that we know um, is getting hit and vandalized a lot, I've, I've worked on a couple of cemeteries where um, certain pathways were taken from, you know, by whomever. So stones along those were getting vandalized on a very regular basis, even after they'd been put back up by conservators. Dig a hole bigger than we need, fill it full of playground sand, put them down in, fill more playground sand over it, throw the earth or sod back on it, just take really good documentation of where you left everything, draw your little maps. You know, everyone on the board of, or everyone interested, maybe they all get a copy. Um, so it sounds like to me, you've you've still got a lot of issues active in your area so maybe yeah maybe putting them back is a good thing for right now right well a lot of the family i'm finding not a lot i guess but some of the family members they're wanting to find out where their people are at and the uh, some of the bricks also turning up missing just family want to bring home souvenirs of loved ones and it's kind of like we wouldn't normally do that in a cemetery, but this one, I guess, is so out, far out in the middle of nowhere that and they don't honestly know when they'll come back. If they yeah. Come out of town, so. and, and they may never come back because what will happen is, you know, this person takes the brick because it reminds, oh, I remember going and visit great granddaddy on this box vault and those were bricks made and blah, blah, blah. And, but his kid it's a brick connections gone they're not they're not going to come back because unless he has said hey everyone this is my great grandfather's and this is really important to me and i mean how many of us really talk to our kids about that i mean how many if your kids walked in your house right now how many would know of the things that are family heirlooms that are important to you have you really talked to them about that it's a brick. That brick's not coming back because when that person dies, the kid's going to go, I don't know, it was a brick, and it's going to get tossed. So you're probably not going to ever get those pieces back. Or a chunk of a headstone. I've seen this before. Oh, my God, Dad stole it. we got to get rid of this. Um, I've talked to families who said, well, such and such took one of those headstones home to protect it. Well, where are they? They're dead. You call them up and they go, oh, my God, I always thought Dad stole that. I, we, we tossed it. We didn't want to get caught with that. Could have gotten arrested for that. Once they leave, it's rare they're ever going to come back. Um, well, I, we're, good. Well, we're actually using the bricks. A lot of them do have the stampings from the different local companies that made them. Yeah. So we're actually using the bricks to predate certain graves that they're attached to from the local um, – uh, brickyards and, and of course mark bricks is what everyone wants so those are gonna <laughs> those are gonna walk away I, I will tell you a, a fast story um i when i was at the city of savannah i got a call one day that a friend of mine who knew i was a conservative of the city of savannah was at a yard sale and there was a box tomb in the backyard of the yard sale and they were like there's someone buried in this neighborhood i was like I i'll come to the yard sale so i came to the yard sale Got there and went, wait a minute, this is a 1950s house. This is an 1860s grave. Who, you know, what's the story here? So I finally went up and I said, hey, just got to ask you, you've got this incredible marble ledger in your backyard. What's the story on that? I said, is, is there a burial? Oh, no, no, no. That's, that's one of our family members. It's like, why do you have it in your yard? Ah. Uh, if you guys know Civil War history, Savannah was occupied. He was a Confederate captain who had been killed and brought home. They were worried the Yankees would vandalize the grave. So they stole it and brought it home. And I said, you didn't bring it to this house. No, the oldest, family, oldest male gets it 
and we have to have it at our house. I said, I think the threat of the Yankees is over. And it really took him to kind of go, well, you know, I never thought about it. I think you're right. Like, this was a new thing. Like, you know, the war had just happened, right? And eventually, after a few months, we got a call. We'd like to bring it back because we're right. We don't need it. And they were having the yard sale because they were selling the house. He was like, I don't want to carry that thing. They were moving out of Savannah to carry that thing with us. That was a grave that had been, it didn't go in one of our city cemeteries, but we were able to help them put it back where it went. Historians went nuts. They had known about this soldier and this grave for decades, and it had always been lost. No one even knew where he was buried. Family member goes up, family lot's got one hole. This is him. He goes right here. He'd been written up in books, people knew, but he had always been lost been sitting in suburbia for the last 30 years he's been he was taken out before the yankees occupied savannah so luckily the threat of the yankees was over and we were able to get it back in the cemetery but yeah i mean things usually don't come back okay i think i saw one more hand back there or did i no Okay, uh, well, I think that will conclude things for us today. We hope to see you all next week for Melissa Easton. Same time, same place uh, on archives and community engagement. And please join me in thanking uh, Jason Church for a wonderful talk. Thank you.